Happy Resurrection Day, by the way. As the custom goes, I'm supposed to say the Lord is risen, and then you're supposed to say the Lord is risen indeed. So you ready? The Lord has risen. The Lord has risen indeed. Wow. Sounds like you folks really believe this stuff. If you don't believe it, we'll be working on you. <laughs> so let me open this up with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for uh, today, grateful for uh, really a very, oh, not just a special Sunday, but really a special week. And there's so much that happened in this week 2,000 years ago. And just help us to look back on it, um, just to appreciate what happened. And also help it not today just to be a history lesson, because it's much more than that. It's the future. You know, we have hope because the tomb is empty. And so uh, just give us that attitude today, particularly as we take uh, the Lord's Supper together on this special day. And as the Bible is taught, I just pray that we would leave here with an attitude of gratitude for what you have done for us and what you will do for us. And you are not a dead Savior. You're a living Savior. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Well, if you could open your Bibles to Luke's Gospel. Um, chapter 24. And verse 27. Luke chapter 24, verse 27. We're going to do something uh, a little bit different today. We're going to depart from our normal topics of the rapture and Genesis. We'll, we'll, we'll finish those. Well, we won't finish them, but we'll get back to them next week. But since this is Holy Week, um, we're going to do something uh, a little bit different today in this teaching and in the main service that follows, and I've entitled this Holy Week in Advance. Holy Week in Advance. This is going to be a little different take on Holy Week, because what I'm going to try to show you in these two sessions is that everything that transpired from last Sunday, Palm Sunday, right up to this Sunday... Resurrection Sunday, everything that went on in the life of Christ was laid out prophetically before it happened. So rather than taking you through the New Testament passages that reveal what happened, I want to show you a slightly different angle on this of the Old Testament passages, written hundreds and in some cases thousands of years in advance, which predicted the details of this week in very minute, specific, intimate detail. So that's a slightly different take, if you will, on Holy Week. And one of the things to understand about Jesus, even before we get into this, is Jesus is the most unique man that's ever walked the face of this earth. That's why John calls him the monogenes, meaning one of a kind. Jesus did things that no human being has ever done. And one of the things that makes him unique is he stepped into history and fulfilled a script that was written about him long before he ever lived. And a lot of that script came into fruition uh, during Holy Week. And so there is no such human being like this. I mean, you know, a typical person is born... And they live their life, and they're, they're not fulfilling a script that was written about them in written form, given by the prophets of old, hundreds of thousands of years in advance. But Jesus, of course, was that very thing. And that's why Jesus, that's why I had you open up to Luke 24, verse 27. This is why Jesus explained this to his disciples when he was walking with them on the Emmaus Road after he had resurrected from the dead. He says during this walk, and of all of the sermons and teachings that I wish I could have been there for as a fly on the wall, this would be my pick. 
um, to hear him explain this because we're just given a summary of it. But I would have loved to hear the full explanation. And in fact, when I get to heaven, I may get bold and ask Jesus to redo that one just for me. But he says in Luke 24, verse 27, then beginning with Moses and with all of the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. And then when you go down to verse 44, he continues and he says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all these things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, notice this word here, must be fulfilled. So what Jesus is claiming to be here is the fulfillment of the script. And the script is what we call the scriptures. And the only scriptures which existed when he made these statements was what we call the Old Testament. Uh, the, the Jews would refer to it as Hebrew Bible. And Hebrew Bible has three divisions in it according to how the Jews organized what we call Old Testament. Our organization as Protestants of the Old Testament is a little bit different than the way the Jews organize the books. They organize them into what is called Tanakh, T-N-K, and each of those words stands for a different division in Hebrew Bible. T stands for Torah, N stands for Nabim, which is the Hebrew word for prophets, and K stands for Kethabim, which means the writings. The most prominent book in the Kethabim is the Psalms. So a lot of times the Psalms is used as a synonym for Kethabim. Moses is used as a synonym for Torah or law because he wrote Hebrew law, Torah, uh, the first five books of the, what we call the Old Testament, sometimes we call it Pentateuch, Penta meaning five, as in five sides, or Penta meaning five, the first five books of Moses, that's the law, or Torah. So when Jesus is speaking, he's speaking as a Jew, and he's speaking to his Jewish disciples, and he says to them, that everything that's just transpired about me in, in this week, including my resurrection, was spoken of in the law of Moses, that's Torah, T, in the prophets, that's the N, or Nabim, and in the Psalms, which is used here as a synonym for the writings, or the Kethabim. So what he is saying is the whole Tanakh points towards me. So you shouldn't be shocked at the things that have happened to me during this week, is what he's saying, because the whole thing is laid out in a script called Tanakh, and the whole Hebrew Bible points towards me prophetically. If you slip over to John chapter 5, verse 39... This is what Jesus is saying to his enemies or those that wanted to kill him. He says to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think in them that you have eternal life. And yet it is these that testify about me. And then if you drop down to verse 46, he says, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. So when he says you search the scriptures, what scriptures is he speaking of? Obviously not the New Testament, such a thing didn't exist yet. He's speaking of Hebrew Bible or Tanakh. And he's making a statement in front of his very enemies, which I guess they could have tried to disprove there on the spot. And the reason they didn't is because they couldn't. He's saying the scriptures that you, re, you revere as Pharisees, that you've spent your whole life studying, Hebrew Bible, Tanakh, all of it points towards me. 
And then he says, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Now, this is very interesting because these people were the experts in the law. That's who the Pharisees were. And what he's saying to them is you've just missed the whole point of your life. <laughs> you've missed the whole point of your studies. Um, you're searching the scriptures all of the time, and yet you don't understand that these scriptures point towards me. And this is one of the reasons they hated him, because he was calling into question their legitimacy as religious leaders. You know, it's like going to a medical doctor that specializes in some specific area and telling them, you know, they don't understand that area. I mean, that's in essence what Jesus is saying here. So again, there's a, there's a second appeal to this script. And if you go over to Acts 17, verses 1 through 3, you will see that the Apostle Paul, when he goes out on his missionary journeys, this is his evangelistic methodology. Particularly to the Jews, he constantly goes to the synagogue and he appeals to the scriptures to show that the very scriptures that the synagogue is set up to study point towards Jesus Christ and that they should believe in Christ. So it says here, this would be on his second journey, Acts 17, verses 1 through 3. It says, now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, notice that. In other words, this is something Paul did regularly. This is something Paul did consistently. It says, according to Paul's custom, he visited them for three Sabbaths. That would be a period of three weeks. And he reasoned with them, trying to refute their understanding of the theory of evolution. Whoops, doesn't say that. He reasoned with them, trying to show them that God exists. No, it doesn't say that. He reasoned with them, trying to show them that they had a God-shaped vacuum inside of them. And if they trusted in Christ, they could live a fulfilled life. Whoops, doesn't say that. See, our, I bring that up because our methods of evangelism today are very different than what you see showcased in the book of Acts. He went into the scripture, uh, the synagogue, and he reasoned with them for three Sabbaths from the scriptures. Now, what scriptures would those be? Not the New Testament. The New Testament was just barely being formulated at this point. Paul was the author of 13 New Testament books. He doesn't even try to reason with them from his own books that he had written by this point. Probably he'd already written Galatians and the two Thessalonian letters. He doesn't reason with them from that. He reasons with them from the scriptures that they knew, which is Hebrew Bible or Tanakh. Verse 3 says, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to, look at that, uh, in other words, Jesus had to fulfill this script because it's written about him in advance by God who can't lie. Explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and, what does it say there? Rise from the dead. And saying, this is the Jesus who I'm proclaiming to you. So he didn't go in arguing for evidence of the empty tomb. And that evidence is powerful and it converts a lot of people. But Paul doesn't do that. He goes into their own scriptures and he starts trying to show them that the things that happened to Jesus on Holy Week are predicted in their own scriptures. And after all, you ought to be aware of this because you're in a synagogue in Thessalonica and you're here to study the scriptures. So shouldn't you understand the point of the scriptures is what, he's, is what Paul is doing here. And he's dealing with this in a reasoning process for three weeks and the book of Acts records a pattern. He doesn't have a lot of fruit from a human perspective in the synagogue. Typically, they kick him out, Paul. And then he goes to the Gentiles with the same message. And the Gentiles get saved like crazy. So it's a very interesting pattern. Uh, why don't you slip over to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. 
Most people believe that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 is the most concise and yet comprehensive statement of the gospel found anywhere in the Bible. And there's a part of it that typically gets missed by us for whatever reason. Paul says, for I handed down to you as of first importance. So th- these are not, this is not a secondary issue here. Uh, this is not a debate about when the Gog Magog invasion happens. You know, is that going to be in the middle of the tribulation, at the end, before it starts? It's not one of those kinds of issues. That's a gray area. Uh, this is the gospel this is primary, this is first importance. For I handed down to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Now look at that next line there. According to the scriptures. Now again, I'll ask what scriptures is he referring to? He's not referring to the books that he had been writing, Paul. He's not even referring to his own book. He's referring to Tanakh or Hebrew Bible. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. And what's the last clause there? According to the scriptures. So most of us, when we share the gospel, we get a lot of it right. We say Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. What we don't tell people is that this was in fulfillment of a script written hundreds and thousands of years in advance. For some reason, we don't see that, but Paul inserts that into his presentation of the gospel. This idea that Jesus stepped into history and fulfilled a script is not just something spoken of in the pages of the Bible. Even secular historians themselves acknowledge this. One of them was a man named Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. He wrote just a little after the time of Christ. He confirms a lot of the details that we find in the Bible, particularly details concerning Christ's prophecies of the destruction of Jerusalem that would come about four decades after the life of Christ, He was a Jewish historian. He was sort of a turncoat and started to work for Rome. But he says a lot of things that we don't take as scriptural, but they confirm an awful lot of things in the Bible. And one of the things he says in his antiquities is as follows, quote, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man. If indeed one ought to call him a man. So, see here, he's confirming the historicity of Jesus. Jesus was a real person. I mean, he was just as real as Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson or Napoleon Bonaparte or any other person that you would accept of history. Josephus goes on and says, For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. And when upon the accusation of the principal principal men among us, Pilate, so there, there he's confirming that Pilate, Pontius Pilate was a historical character. Pilate had condemned him to a cross. And those who had first come to love him did not cease He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life. Oh, tell me it's not true. You mean even secular history affirms the resurrection of Jesus? And that's what I'm saying here. And then the point I wanted to draw your attention to is this clause here. For the prophets of God had foretold these things. So what Josephus is saying here is exactly what Christ said on the Emmaus Road. It's exactly what Christ said to the Pharisees. It's exactly what Paul said in the synagogues on his missionary journeys. 
it's exactly what Paul inserted as part of the gospel. Josephus is reaffirming here that Jesus lived a life that was in a script written hundreds and thousands of years in advance. Many of the details of that script fulfilled on Holy Week. And Josephus goes on and he says, and a thousand other marvels about him. And then the tribe of the Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. So he's writing post AD 70, he's writing towards, you know, most believed towards the end of the first century. And he says, these Christians, these, these people that keep believing in Jesus and promoting Jesus Christ, I mean, their, their tribe hasn't decreased, it's increased. I might add, in spite of a lot of persecution. So uh, that's the thing to understand about Jesus is his uniqueness. Now, the last two Sundays on Resurrection Sunday, going back last year and the year before, I preached the same sermon twice. That's terrible. I shouldn't do that, right? But most, most people can't remember what I talked about last week, <laughs> let alone last year. I, I, frankly, I don't remember what I talked about last week. I'm trying to remember what I talked about Wednesday night. But I gave a, a, a sermon on the uniqueness of Jesus, just trying to communicate that Jesus, when you put your faith in Jesus, you're putting your faith in someone that's extraordinary, that's done things no human being has ever done. He was a man of verifiable history. He was a man of fulfilled prophecy. He was a man that made his own prophecies. He was a man whose morality was unquestionable. He was a man that gave the world the deepest teaching it's ever received. He was a man of authentic miracles. You might notice that Josephus even makes reference to the marvelous and surprising deeds Jesus did. He's authenticating that Jesus was a man of miracles. And of course, the last thing that made him unique is he rose bodily from the dead. Now you put those seven things together and no human being can ever come close to fulfilling this list. And yet Jesus Christ did. All seven came together simultaneously in his life. So when you become a Christian, it is not a blind faith. It's not a leap into a dark chasm. It's faith that's founded upon actual evidence. And these seven points give you, I think, the evidence. And so what I'm going to do this morning and in the sermon that follows is I'm, I'm focusing here on number two. I'm focusing on the fact that Jesus was a man of fulfilled prophecy. And to do that, I have selected 11 prophecies. There's the first five and there is the remaining six that to me are the very clearest prophecies written in advance that Jesus fulfilled on Holy Week. And as we get into these, um, I want to communicate that it was a struggle just picking these 11 because there were many, many others I could have picked. So this list isn't even exhaustive. You know, it's not comprehensive. You can go back and find other prophecies, but by my way of thinking, these are the major 11 ones that were fulfilled by Jesus Christ in his life from last Sunday, the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday, up to this Sunday, um, which is Resurrection Sunday. And as we go through these, you're going to say, well, how could these have been written before they happened? Well, the short answer to that is God authored the Old Testament books just like he wrote the New Testament books. He used human authors, but when the prophets of old spoke, they were writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And since God, as the author, capital A, was directing them, and God is omniscient, it should stand to reason that those prophets of old would see things way beyond their time frame. 
And a lot of the things the Holy Spirit directed him to was things that would happen in the life of the Messiah. And there is no doubt that these Old Testament books, I'll give you several, Daniel, Zechariah, Isaiah, the Psalms, there's no doubt that these books were written in advance. There's absolutely no question about that. I've got the years in advance on the far right-hand column. But even if you don't accept that dating, what you have to understand is that there was a Greek translation of Hebrew Bible written around two centuries before Jesus ever lived. That's a documented fact. And the reason they wanted a Greek translation of Hebrew Bible is Alexander the Great in the intertestamental time period a little before had come into power and he pursued Hellenization and he wanted to create a Greek monolithic culture and world. You know, he was a one-worlder, Alexander the Great. He was a globalist. He wanted the whole world to have the same culture. And he wanted everyone to be speaking Greek. And so by the time of Jesus, that was the dominant language of people. Now, don't let that bother you because that was the hand of God in that. The Greek language is, most people believe, one of the richest, deepest dialects you can ever have. For example, we have one word for love in English. The Greeks had four. Uh, Storgus, family love. Uh, Phileo, brotherly love. Eros, romantic love. And then agape, selfless love. So when the Greeks wanted to describe something, I mean, they had the linguistic tools to really get it down so you'd understand what was going on. And that's why Alexander the Great, this globalist, this one-worlder that wanted to bring in a universal culture, um, that's why that was actually the hand of God in that. Because God was allowing that to happen so that his word could be recorded in the richest dialect the human race has ever seen, called the New Testament. And 200 years before Jesus ever existed, there was a commission that the Hebrew Bible be translated into Greek. That's called the Septuagint. Uh, sometimes you'll see it abbreviated with the Roman numerals LXX, which means 70. According to tradition, um, and this comes from a letter called the letter of Aristius. This uh, Septuagint was created by 70 scholars in 70 days. And so when people say, well, we don't really know if Psalms was written in advance. Yeah, yes, we do. We don't really know if Daniel was written before the time of Christ. Yes, we do. Because we have the Septuagint. I mean, this is an absolute document. In fact, it's, it's not something you can question. Questioning this would be like questioning the law of gravity. 200 years before Jesus showed up, there was a book called Hebrew Bible in existence. The Septuagint, the Hebrew translated into Greek for reasons I've tried to explain. Now, even besides that, the date of these books goes far back beyond the Septuagint. But you may not accept the conservative dating. I'm assuming most people here would. But even if you don't accept the conservative dating, at bare minimum, this is bare bones, two centuries before Jesus walked the face of the earth, Hebrew Bible was written and in existence. So these are actual predictive prophecies that occurred in the life of Christ. So there's our list of 11, and what I don't finish uh, in the first session, we'll try to finish in the second session. That's why you people that came to Sunday school are at a huge, you guys are like the A students. You're like at a huge advantage given this background. All right, prophecy number one is the day of the triumphal entry. We celebrated that last Sunday. Was predicted by the prophet Daniel 600 years before it happened. 
and the exact day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey and proclaim his messianic credentials to the nation of Israel was not only predicted in advance, watch, watch this now, but it was predicted to the exact day. 600 years before it happened. Now, 600 years, you look at these numbers on the right there, 600, 500, 700, and one I'll be putting up later, um, a thousand years in advance, you know, you're tempted to just kind of let that go in one ear and out the other because we're not accustomed to dealing with figures that large when it becomes years, but 600 years is a long time. The United States of America has only been in existence for what, 240 something years. We're dealing with something that is double the United States of America in terms of our national longevity and then more. So don't let the length of the years escape notice here. Six centuries before Jesus walked the face of the earth, the prophet Daniel in Babylon was given a prophecy from Gabriel communicating a lot of things, not the least of which the exact day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem and proclaim his messianic credentials to the nation of Israel. You find that in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. Which says, you are to know, so this is not guesswork, this is certainty, as Gabriel is giving Daniel this prophecy. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks it will be rebuilt again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. So from the point of a decree, by the way, that decree happened in Nehemiah chapter 2, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the coming of Messiah the Prince, notice he's not called the king here, because his kingship was rejected, as Daniel will, will explain. Until the coming of Messiah the Prince, there is going to be seven sevens and 62 sevens, 69 sevens, or 483 years. And when you understand the Jewish calendar has 360 days on it, what he's saying is there's going to be 173,880 days in between the decree of Artaxerxes and Palm Sunday, which was the historic time when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and proclaimed his credentials to the Messiah. So that decree was given March the 5th, 44 BC, and when you do the math on this, and it's, not, it's a little tricky, you've got to convert Gentile calendar years to Jewish calendar years, and it requires a long explanation, which I don't have time to give you. If you go back into our Daniel series that we did here at this church and go to that verse, you can get that long explanation. In fact, we were studying the 70 weeks prophecy probably longer than 70 weeks in this church. But from the time of that decree until Palm Sunday, March the 30th, A.D. 33, there's going to be exactly 483 years or 173,880 days. Now, what you have to understand is the brightest minds that have ever walked the face of this earth have looked into this and found it to be exactly accurate. One of them is named Sir Robert Anderson, who was really the first to unlock this in terms of an explanation. He wrote a book called The Coming Prince. He was actually involved in criminal forensics, working with Scotland Yard of his day, and was actually instrumental in solving the Jack the Ripper case, you remember that in history, that, you know, this madman running around cutting out the throats of people, and, and he was the one that figured out who the guy was. He was instrumental in bringing down Jack the Ripper. 
So that's what kind of mind you're dealing with. And he is the first one that really began to show in the, his book, The Coming Prince, that this prophecy was fulfilled to the exact day. Um, my professor, Harold Honer, who's now with the Lord, who had two doctorates, he wrote his book, which you can see on the bottom right there, called The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ, which was part of his dissertation at Cambridge. So all of these highfalutin European scholars had to sign off on what he was saying. Uh, he shows also in his book that this prophecy was fulfilled to the exact day. He just felt that Anderson's dates were not correct because he felt he had more um, information in his time period than Anderson's time period concerning when Artaxerxes came to the throne in Persia. There was more archaeological evidence unfolded and that changes the date a little bit of the decree in Nehemiah chapter 2. But both of these men show in their writings that this prophecy has the potential of being fulfilled to the exact day. In fact, Harold Honer was my dissertation reader at Dallas Seminary. So I used to talk to him all the time. He was just a very, um, you know, congenial, uh, godly person, very open to conversation. And I remember saying to him, I said, well, do you think that you pick those dates arbitrarily? Because he picked the day of the decree as March the 5th, 444 BC, and the date of the triumphal entry, March the 30th, AD 33. Did you, Dr. Honer, actually he had two doctors, so... I guess I was supposed to call him Dr. Dr. Honer. Um, did you pick those dates arbitrarily just to make it fit? And he looked me square in the eye and he says, I absolutely did not. In fact, when you read his book, The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ, you'll see that he came up with those dates first based on history. Not really expecting Daniel's prophecy to be fulfilled to the exact day. And then he writes in there, when he did the calculation, he himself was more shocked than anybody else. That it came out to the exact day. So, now in the Quran, I know of no such prophecy like this. Or any other alleged holy book. And that's why Jesus, on Palm Sunday, commemorated last week... When he rode into Jerusalem and proclaimed his messianic credentials to the nation, that's why he made an issue out of the day. Jesus said, if you had known to the people of Israel, even had known in this day, even you the things that would make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. Verse 44, and they will level you to the ground, AD 70, and your children within you, and that's a, that's a pretty good pro-life verse right there, isn't it? Your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. The temple is going to be destroyed brick by brick 40 years later. Because you did not recognize, what does he say, the time of your visitation. They had no excuse for not understanding who he was. Because he's alluding to Daniel, who predicted this day. Uh, 600 years before it happened. That's why when they say, uh, tell your disciples to be quiet as they're praising Jesus on Palm Sunday. That's why Jesus says to the Pharisees, I tell you the truth, if, if I tell them to be quiet, the stones themselves are going to cry out. Because this was no ordinary day. This was a special day predicted by Daniel. And so that's prophecy number one. Um, and think of all of the Palm Sunday hoopla and celebrations that went on last week in Christianity. How many churches are talking about this? That this is a prophetic, prophetically significant day. For whatever reason, this just escapes our mind as 21st century Christians. But this is part of a script. 
The second prophecy is that Jesus, when he came to proclaim his messianic credentials to the nation. Oh, by the way, before I leave that, that one, going back to this first one here. It explains what's called the messianic secret. Matthew 16, verse 20, Jesus says, Then he gave the disciples strict orders that they were to tell no one that he was the Christ. Have you ever read that in your Bible? Why would he say that? That doesn't make any sense. Unless you understand the prophecy I just went over. He tells them not to tell anybody who he is because the revelation of his identity to the nation is coming just around the corner. So until that day arrives, and it's a specific day in history, the triumphal entry, don't don't tell anybody who I am, even though you disciples know who I am. And that's called the messianic secret. And theologians spend... Uh, I don't know how many hundreds and thousands of pages of ink have been spilled trying to explain the messianic secret because it doesn't make sense why Jesus would say, you know, zip, zip it up, in other words. Don't tell anybody who I am until Daniel's prophecy reaches its climax. Uh, most people, when they try to explain that messianic secret, they don't reference Daniel 9.25. They come up with some strange, you know, answer. But it makes perfect sense if you understand Daniel 9.25 as the background, which is part of the script. All right, prophecy number two is he would ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey. And you'll see that in the book of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. This was written 500 years in advance. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation. And he's coming through in a massive tank and he's going to gun down all of his opposition. No, it doesn't say that. He will be humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt. The fowl of a, or the foal of a donkey. Now, when you go to Matthew 21 and you look at verses 1 through 8, you'll see how that prophecy was fulfilled. It says, When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethan Podge or Page at the Mount of Olives, this is the triumphal entry. Palm Sunday, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with it. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them and he will send them on immediately. Now this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed, and they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their cloaks on them, and he sat on the cloaks. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them out on the road, Palm Sunday. So he goes out of his way to make sure that his disciples get the donkey that he's supposed to ride in on, because if he didn't, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 would never be fulfilled. Now what human author could come up with something like this? That your king, the king of the universe, is coming to his own nation in such a humble way. Now I'm here to tell you that the second coming is going to be totally different. He's not coming on a donkey in the second coming. He's coming on a a white horse. He's coming with the armies of heaven. He is not coming to be rejected this next time around. He's coming to execute justice and establish his kingdom on the earth. 
You'll find a description of that in Revelation 19, verse 11, which says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Wait a minute, I thought he was called the Prince of Peace. He is. The second time around, he's not coming to bring peace. Okay. The age of grace is today. When he comes back the second time, he's coming back to make war. He is not coming back as Islam teaches, where Jesus is sort of a sidekick of the Muslim deity. That's why Muslims will say, oh yeah, we believe in Jesus. Yeah, their definition of it. To them, Jesus is kind of like a sidekick. They're not even sure if he died on a cross or not. And when he comes back, he's kind of under some kind of delegated authority of the Islamic deity. And that is not what the Bible says. That's a perversion of what the Bible says. Um, The Bible written long before the Quran never says that. Jesus is coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. Amen? But the first time he comes, it won't be that way. He's coming in humility on a donkey to be rejected. Now, if a human being wrote this book, they would just chop out part one and include part two, and the whole thing would be a reigning savior. But that's not what God wrote in his word. What God wrote in his word is Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, would come on in humility on a donkey the first time. Prophecy number three is that he would be rejected by his own nation. This again is Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks written 600 years before it happens and Daniel predicted Right after verse 25, which we've already read, which gives you the date of Palm Sunday, Daniel 9.26 says, then after the 62 weeks, in other words, after the time period leading up to Palm Sunday has been elapsed, what's going to happen at that point? Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. Probably a picture there of the crucifixion. But the primary meaning, I think, of being cut off is being cut off from being king. Cut off from his inheritance as king. Because his own nation, the nation of Israel, in the first century, the leadership I'm speaking of, would not accept the messiahship of their own king, even though he came to them exactly when Daniel predicted. Then after the 62 weeks, the messiah will be cut off and have nothing, no inheritance, no kingship. Now here come the prophecies about AD 70 that Josephus tells us about. And the people of the prince, see how he's called the prince here? Why is he called the prince? Because he's not king. Because his nation rejected him as king. And, the peop- and that's why the title of Sir Robert Anderson's book, the classic, is The Coming Prince. Comes right out of the scripture. And the people of the prince who is to come, now that's Titus of Rome, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come with a flood, even till the end. And there will be war. Desolations are determined. Now, there is a whole branch of theology called Kingdom Now Theology. And probably um, most Christians are sitting in churches that teach Kingdom Now theology, and they don't really know it. But Kingdom Now theology is the idea that Jesus started an invisible kingdom, a spiritual kingdom in his first coming. No, he did not. The Bible is very clear that he would be cut off and have nothing. He would be disinherited for a season from the kingdom promises. So the church today is not the kingdom. And the kingdom is not the church. The church consists of people who have believed the message given to Israel that Israel rejected. 
And don't worry about the kingdom. God, that's all going to be taken care of in the second advent. But we are not in the kingdom age now. The nation of Israel, its leadership, rejected the offer of the kingdom. So this is just an amazing prophecy. That when the king comes, his own people won't receive him. That's why John... In John chapter 1 verse 11 says, he came to his own. Now in context, who is his own? The nation of Israel. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. I mean, it's, it's, it's all there 600 years in advance that the nation wouldn't receive him when he, became, when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. On time, by the way. That's why when he's riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey, it says he started to weep. Why would he, why would he weep? He's weeping because he knows the prophecy that he's going to be rejected. And for the nation, at least in the first century, there's going to be a terrible consequence of that rejection. Not the least of which is A.D. 70 where a million Jews would lose their lives. And he, I think, is weeping because he's thinking about what is going to happen according to Daniel's specific prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. So I, I would ask you again, what human author could come up with something like this? That's not what's supposed to happen to a king. I mean, you're supposed to have a reigning Messiah. You don't have someone who is rejected by their own nation. And you certainly, who could have ever come up with this? That God took lemons and turned them into lemonade. Because as that transaction happened, and as Israel turned Christ over to Rome for execution, God took a tragedy and turned it around into a triumph, as only God can do. And he fastened the sin debt of the whole world into the death of Christ. So what Satan thought was a victory ended up being a fatal defeat as far as the angelic conflict is concerned. So Israel rejected the king. Israel today, I love Israel and I'm pro-Zionist and I vote pro-Israel every chance I get. But the fact of the matter is the nation of Israel today is just as blind as they were 2,000 years ago. I'm not saying that individual Jews can't get saved today. Some do. What I'm saying is the nation of Israel is in stark, cold, total spiritual blindness. And it's going to take the events of the tribulation period to jolt them out of that, out of that blindness. Because everybody today is all upset with Israel, with what they're doing with these vaccinations how Israel is kind of leading the way into these mandatory vaccinations. And, you know, Israel is making people wear these ankle bracelets that haven't been vaxxed. And, and you can go online and you can see some dissenting Jewish voices very upset what's happening in their country. And everybody's shocked that it's Israel leading the way into darkness. And my point is, why would you expect anything better from Israel? given her current spiritual state. Now, praise the Lord, uh, that blindness is going to be lifted from them nationally in the tribulation. But until that happens, they're, they're, they're as blind as a bat. They might be the most successful uh, political country on the face of the earth, and they can't see their nose in front of them or their hand in front of them spiritually. Because they have been given over to judicial blindness because of what happened 2,000 years ago. And so when a Jew gets saved today, and some do, that's like a big deal. I mean, God really, <laughs> I think God does a lot to get any of us saved. But particularly in that case. And so here it's predicted that the nation of Israel would be rejected by their own Messiah. Prophecy number four is that when Christ comes, he would be completely and totally innocent. Exodus 12 and verse 5 is part of the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb 
is really what broke Pharaoh's back and released God's people, Israel, from 400 years of bondage through Passover. And I've had some, some good people say, well, we don't agree with that map because Mount Sinai might not be in that location. So we want to be an equal opportunist here. There's another map that's got Mount Sinai in a different location and another map. So we attempt to be all things to all men. But wherever Mount Sinai was, they wouldn't have even gotten to Mount Sinai had they not gotten out of Egyptian bondage. And the event that got them out of Egyptian bondage was Passover, where God went in plague 10, went throughout Egypt and killed the firstborn all over Egypt. Now Israel would get an exemption from that plague if they took the blood of the Passover lamb and put it on their doorposts. Now, there's very specific instructions given for the Passover lamb, right? Exodus 12, verse 5. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male. A year old. In other words, this lamb, in order for it to be efficacious, the blood of the lamb to be efficacious has to be perfect genetically. No blemishes. And, of course, that points to Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Because when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, in John chapter 1, verse 29, he said, Behold, what? The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Takes away the sin of the world. Passover Lamb couldn't take away the sin of the world. The only thing he could do is to postpone the note of indebtedness, the day of reckoning, for a year. And Yom Kippur would come, day of covering would come, and they had to offer another one. And another one. But Jesus is the embodiment and the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. And just as the Passover lamb had to be perfect, Jesus had to be without sin. Now, you'll see this predicted uh, in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 9. Which says he has done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. You'll see it predicted in Isaiah 53 verse 11. The righteous one, my servant. When he comes, he's going to be perfect. And I have sought to show Jewish people these scriptures. Isaiah 53. Written 700 years in advance. And they get very nervous when I show it to them. And they run off to their rabbi to get an interpretation. And they come back with this interpretation that Isaiah 53 is not speaking of Jesus. It's speaking of the nation of Israel. At which point I ask them, what Bible are you reading? Because it says here, the Messiah must be perfect. Are you telling me that Israel was perfect? I mean, if Israel was perfect, why did God keep sending prophets to you know, critique them and send them into the 70 years captivity? Of course, this is not about Israel. This is about the Messiah of Israel, Jesus Christ, who had to be perfect. And if he wasn't perfect, then he couldn't fulfill the typology of the Passover lamb. Given 1,400 years uh, in advance. Now, Jesus had six legal trials on Holy Week, during Holy Week. Three from the Jews, three from the Roman authorities. And those trials, as you study them in the Gospels, were a complete farce. They were a miscarriage of justice. Attorneys that have looked at, at this and tried to explain it, it's, it's laughable what they did here to Christ. Uh, they, what they did is they just jammed him through the judicial system to get him dead as fast as they could. They had no desire to look at truth. They had no desire to look at evidence. In fact, there wasn't any evidence against him. They made it up as they went. Um, Mark... 15, 
verses 55 through 59, says, Now the chief priests and the entire council were trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they weren't finding any. For many were giving false testimony. I mean, where, where is Alan Dershowitz when we need him? And so their testimonies were not consistent and then stood up and began giving false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy the temple um, that was made by hands and in three days I will build another made without hands. And even in this respect, their testimony was inconsistent. That's why, what does Pilate do? When this whole thing comes before him, he washes his hands and said, this man is innocent. And in fact, Pilate's wife, you remember, had the dream. You better not <laughs> be involved in this, she's telling him, because you're going to put an innocent person to death. Uh, of course, the thief that was hanging with him there on the cross, what did that thief say? This man has done nothing wrong. You know, even a common criminal dying with him could see what was happening. And then you have the famous uh, story of the Roman centurion at the end of Mark's gospel who watched him die and said, truly, this man was the son of God. And when you're dying that way, wouldn't there be an opportunity for a slip up morally? Wouldn't there be an opportunity to get angry at God? Wouldn't there be an opportunity to speak with words of retaliation against your accusers when you're watching him die? And yet the people that watched him die said even when he died, he was innocent. The trials were a joke because they put an innocent man to death is what happened. Uh, the people that knew Christ the best were Peter and John. It was John that leaned against Christ's chest in the upper room. And it was Peter that was in the inner circle. Peter, James, and John. And look at their testimonies. Peter writes in his book, For you have been called for this purpose, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving for you an example so that you would follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And then John simply calls Jesus, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I mean, would the people that are closest to you look at your life and say it's sinless? Would your husband or wife look at your life and say it's sinless? I mean, my wife is right there. You can ask her at intermission. I mean, this is testimony coming from people that watched him die. This is coming from his closest friends friends closest companions and they're all saying he's he was completely innocent and yet he had to be innocent to fulfill the Passover typology that an innocent substitute must be killed killed in the place of the guilty for the sins of the world to be paid for anyway we've I'm sure glad I divided this into two I was going to try to do this whole thing today so we're going to finish the remaining numbers 4 through 11, climaxing, by the way, in the resurrection in the main service. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for uh, your word, your truth, and the script that was written that reveals so many details about this very special week that we look back on and celebrate as Christians. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. happy intermission. I like the name Resurrection Day a lot better than Easter, don't you? Amen. Amen. Well, if you have a copy of your Bible with you, could you open it up to Isaiah 53 and verse 7? I'm pulling a dirty trick on you today because I'm doing part two of a sermon that I started in Sunday school. So those that came to Sunday school are more spiritual. <laughs> and they have a little leg up but essentially what we're doing here is we're taking a look at Holy Week Holy Week <clears throat> technically speaking started last Sunday with a triumphal entry 
And it covers the final week of Christ's life from the triumphal entry, which is Palm Sunday, and takes you all the way to today, which is Resurrection Sunday. And it would be somewhat tempting to just take out the New Testament passages and cover that week. But I'm not doing that. I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm trying to show you that the events that transpired in the life of Jesus Christ in that week, you could know about even if you knew nothing about the New Testament. Because that final week of his life prior to his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension is actually predicted hundreds and thousands of years in the Old Testament. Jesus himself many times when he was living on the earth made reference to that fact. He said, would say things like this, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life. But these are the scriptures which speak of me. There were probably about 109 prophecies. Think about that. That were fulfilled in the life of Christ. And the prophecies start to accelerate dramatically. As you start to track their fulfillment into Holy Week. And so what I've done is I have selected 11 such prophecies four of which we covered in Sunday school. Number one, the exact day, and you heard me right on that, the exact day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey proclaiming his messianic credentials to the nation of Israel is predicted 600 years in advance in Daniel chapter 9 verse 25. The very fact that he would ride in on a donkey is predicted by the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, 500 years in advance. And the fact that things from the human viewpoint wouldn't turn out well. As this was happening, as we looked at it and commemorated it last Sunday... That in and of itself is predicted by the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 verse 26, 600 years in advance. It's a prediction that he would be rejected by his own nation. And then also the fact that he would go through his life without committing a single sin. In fact, kind of dialing back into Sunday school just for a minute. In the final week of Christ's life, he went through six legal trials, six of them, three religious before the nation of Israel, three civil before the Roman authorities, and as you study those six trials from a legal perspective, they are what you would call a miscarriage of justice. Evidence was manufactured against him. To fulfill Isaiah's prophecies that he would be absolutely innocent before his accusers. In fact, he had to be innocent because the only sacrifice that God will accept in the place of the guilty is a perfect innocent sacrifice. And Isaiah predicted that. And you see that showcased in the New Testament as his enemies had to manufacture evidence against him to get him killed. This takes us up to speed here, and now we come to our fifth prophecy. And this, was, this is all new material. Number five, he would be silent before his accusers as all of this was happening. This uh, is one of the reasons I don't think a mere human being could have written this book. Because if the most popular people in the world are ever accused of doing something wrong and they're innocent, boy, you can hear them scream, can't you? You can hear them yell, you can hear them take the issue to court, you could hear them defend their rights. And Isaiah specifically predicted that when this miscarriage of justice happened to Jesus, he would be silent before his accusers. That was predicted 700 years in advance, and that's why I had you open up to Isaiah 53 and verse 7. 
This is a prophecy of Jesus seven centuries before he lived. And it says of Jesus, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. It's a tremendous description of what happened to Christ in these six trials on Holy Week. For example, on Mark, in Mark 14, verses 60 and 61, covering one of those religious trials, it says this, And then the priest stood up and came forward and questioned him, saying, Do you not offer any answer for what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent. And he did not, not offer any answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? In other words, you're claiming to be the Messiah. Evidence is manu being manufactured against you. Speak up for yourself. Defend yourself. And yet he didn't. Mark 15, verses 4 and 5. This is one of his civil trials. It says, but Pilate questioned him, saying, do you offer nothing in answer? See how many charges they are bringing against you. But Jesus said nothing further in answer, and so Pilate was amazed. Of course he was amazed. No one would do something like this, particularly someone of his stature. The book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 of Jesus in the New King James Version translation says this, he made himself of no reputation. He was not a skilled manipulator. He was not someone to hold a press conference. He was not someone to let the entire world know what had happened to him was an injustice. He was completely quiet in the midst of all of it. Why? Because that's what Isaiah said would happen. And again, a human author would never portray a savior acting like that. They would portray him demanding justice till the very last moment. Not so this man, Jesus Christ. Now, we come here to number six, and not only would he be silent before his accusers... But David in the Psalms predicted that the Roman soldiers, he doesn't name them as Roman soldiers, but in hindsight we, knew, we know this has been fulfilled by the Roman soldiers, would actually gamble for his clothing. You see this in Psalm 22. Now this is a prophecy, a millennium in advance, a thousand years, which is a long time. Psalm 22, and you might want to just hold your place in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, because those are the areas where you see the most of these Holy Week prophecies being fulfilled. Psalm 22 is a prophecy about David. And yet the prophecies that David gives, as David is describing his experiences, obviously transcend David. They go above and beyond anything that David, a thousand years in advance, experienced. And so we take them as messianic prophecies. And notice what Psalm 22, and notice what verse 18 says. They, not speaking of David here, because this never happened to David. They divide my garments among them, and they cast lots for my clothing. This uh, finds a fulfillment, as you see from the screen, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 35, which says, And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. He would, he would die such a common death that even in death itself, he would be ridiculed and lowered to the point where the Roman soldiers, to some of them, I guess, had their eye on his clothes, which couldn't have been that expensive anyway, would engage in just a mere game of chance to gather those mere belongings of Jesus as those belongings were stripped from him 
as he was led to that cross to die. Now, it's interesting that I have been to the nation of Israel three times. And one of the places that you can go is the area where they believed that Christ actually went through many of these trials and suffered such a horrific fate. And it is interesting that when you go there, you can find etched in the rocks, in the stones. And most archaeologists testify that those things that I'm speaking of here are found from the Greco-Roman period. You can find there little games of chance that people used to play from this time period. Uh, A modern equivalent would be, you know, tic-tac-toe or something like that. A game of luck, a game of chance, a game of competition. And it sort of shows the veracity of the scripture that there were these games of chance. And David foresaw these games of chance like gambling would be used to gamble for the humble clothes of the Messiah when he comes. Yet another prophecy, and this takes us to number seven, and this is very interesting here. There's a prediction three times that I could find in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be pierced. Notice back in Psalm 22, verse 16. David is describing his experiences, but he goes obviously above and beyond his experiences. And he says this in Psalm 22, verse 16, For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has has encompassed me. And then he specifically says, They have pierced my hands and my feet. Not just piercing part of his body, but there would be a piercing of both hands and feed. Notice, if you will, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. Again, a prophecy given 700 years in advance, and it says this, but he, speaking of Jesus, was pierced, a specific language there is pierced, for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment of our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. What stripes? Well, part of his stripes or his wounds would be this piercing that took place. Let me show you this one more time. It's in the prophet Zechariah, given 500 years in advance. And it says this, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of pleading so that they will look upon me whom they have pierced. There it is a third time. They will mourn for him like one mourning for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him like the weeping over a firstborn. It's an amazing prediction about the future conversion of the nation of Israel one day. And the day in history will arise when the nation of Israel will begin to mourn. And they will look back into their history and said, you know, the one that our ancestors pierced is actually the true Messiah. And in the process of giving that amazing prediction about the future of Israel, it speaks of the piercing of the Messiah. Now, the reason I find this so interesting is, think about this for a minute, how did the Jews execute people? They never pierced them. They stoned them to death. And when you go to the land of Israel, you can figure out pretty fast why they did that, because there's stones everywhere. It was very convenient. And when I mention stoned, I'm not talking about what they do in Colorado, obviously. It's a literal stoning. And I love Colorado, by the way. Leviticus 24, not for that reason. (laughs) Sometimes you say something and then you think, should I leave that on the table? I need to get that off the table pretty quick. But Leviticus 24 verse 16 says this, Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. Speaking of how Israel dealt dealt with criminals, all the congregation shall surely 
stone him. Uh, in uh, Numbers 15, verses 32 through 36, it speaks there of a man picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And they come to Moses and they say, what, what shall we do with this man? And it says, the man, Moses says, the man must be put to death and all the congregation shall stone him with stones. Verse 36, so all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones just as the Lord had commanded. In fact, you might know this, that they tried to stone Jesus to death several times before he was taken into custody. John 8 verses 58 and 59 says, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I knew Abraham, Jesus says. And it goes on and it says, therefore, they picked, uh, and, and he claimed the title I am, a divine title. It says, therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus himself hid himself and left the temple grounds. Think of the first uh, execution of the age of the church. A man named Stephen was executed. It says in Acts 7, verses 58 and 59, when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. Verse 59 says, they went on stoning Stephen. And he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I mean, it's very obvious as you move through the scripture that the Hebrews stoned people to death. That's how they dealt with their perception of criminals. And yet the prophecies are more specific than that. The prophecies don't predict that he would be stoned to death. They very clearly predict that he would be pierced. In fact, his hands and very feet would be pierced. So now we have a dilemma. How could those prophecies ever be fulfilled of piercing when that's not how the Hebrews executed their own criminals? And the answer to that is a man named Pompey who in 63 BC, about six decades before the time of Christ came into the land of Israel and they came into Jerusalem and they subjugated as Roman powers, a Roman power, the Jewish nation. When Christ walked the face of the earth in the land of Israel, Israel nationally was under foreign dominion. And one of the things the Romans did to show that they were the boss and not Israel is they took away from the Jews the right to execute their own criminals. So when the Jews picked up stones to stone him to death, they were violating Roman law. When they stoned Stephen to death, they were violating Roman law. And consequently, although there was a desire to stone Jesus to death, they couldn't do it that way. They had to rush him through their own judicial system to manufacture evidence against him so we can get him dead as quick as possible. And then they had to quickly turn him over to Rome for execution. Why did they have to turn him over to Rome? Why are there these six legal trials? The final three are civil trials. It's because of what Pompey did six decades in advance. And I want you to, to see this because it's so extraordinary what the Holy Spirit predicts. The Holy Spirit is predicting geopolitical changes long before they would happen. The Holy Spirit is actually predicting Rome would come and subjugate Israel and remove from Israel the right to execute their own criminals. And why did all of these things come into existence so the specifics of God's word could be fulfilled. God means what he says and says what he means. And the person with egg on their face at the end of the day is the person that questions God's word. I mean, it would be so easy to look at these prophecies and say they're ridiculous. How could the Messiah be pierced? But given enough time, history has a tendency to catch up with God's word. 
Because God knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And the Romans, as you know, developed a devilish way of execution called the crucifixion. In fact, it wasn't even the Romans that came up with this. It was the Assyrians that came up with this. Do you remember Jonah did not want to see the grace of God go to Assyria and became angry at God because of the conversion of Nineveh, an Assyrian city? There's a reason for that. The Assyrians in history were some of the most diabolical, bloodthirsty people that have ever lived on planet Earth. And they developed the instrument of crucifixion as a means of capital punishment. And when Rome came on the scene and Pompey subjugated the land of Israel, all Rome did is reach back into history and said, this looks like a great way to kill people. And they brought it to life. And they executed people in public ways. So that if you were a potential dissident, you're going to think twice. Because of this agonizing method of death. My point is God allows the whole thing to come into existence. So the specifics of the piercing prophecies could be fulfilled. And they were fulfilled, weren't they? In the life of Christ. Christ in his death was pierced. John 20 verse 25 says, So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he, that's Thomas, said to them, Unless I see the hands, his hands, the imprints of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe John 20 verse 27 says, Then he said to Thomas, Place your finger here, see my hands, and take your hand and put it in my side, and do not continue to disbelieve, but believe. Thomas, everything happened exactly like the prophet said. I was pierced. In John 19 verses 34 through 37, it says, Yet one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may also believe again another scripture says they will look upon whom they have pierced The Roman soldiers got to Jesus and they didn't break his legs. We'll talk about that next. He was already dead, but we need to make sure he's dead. So they thrust into his side a spear. And when they saw the blood and the water coming out of his side separated, those that have medical knowledge tell me that that's the sign of a ruptured heart. They had to see that to make sure he was dead because tragically, and this is just, it's insane when you think about this, they had to get to church fast because it was the Sabbath. That's the spirit of religion right there. We've got to get him dead. We've got to make sure he's dead. We've got to get these dead people off the cross because we need to go and celebrate the Sabbath. That's what religion will do to you. It will blind you to what is happening right in front of you. And consequently, the piercing of the side happened because that's what Zechariah, Isaiah, and Psalm 22 says. His hands and his feet were pierced according to Roman execution methodology because that's what the prophets predicted. This takes us now to number eight on our list here. And this is amazing too. Number eight, in the process of his death, not a single bone of his would be broken. This takes us back to the Passover lamb. Passover lamb is the lamb that was killed. And the Jews in Passover took the blood of the lamb and they sprinkled it on their doorposts. And so when God came through Egypt in plague number 10, killing all of the firstborn, when God saw the blood on the doorpost, his wrath would pass over, hence the title Passover. 
would pass over the homes where the blood had been applied. That's why when the wrath of God comes one day, and it's coming, as the Lord finds the blood of the ultimate Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, on you, metaphorically, because you've received as a free gift what he's done for you, the wrath of God will pass right on over you. Praise the Lord. But you'll notice that it can't just be any ordinary Passover lamb. Exodus 12 verse 5 says he must be perfect, unblemished. And then notice Exodus 12 verse 46. This is 1,400 years before Jesus ever walked the face of this earth. It says it is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring any of the meat outside of the house, watch this, nor are you to break any of its bones. In the process of the death of the Passover lamb, no bone in that lamb shall be broken. Now, we know who the fulfillment of this is. It's Jesus Christ. Because when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said in John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold, the Lamb of God that, watch this, takes away the sin of the world. The Passover Lamb couldn't take away the sin of the world. It could kick the can down the road a, a little bit. Postponed the day of reckoning, but Yom Kippur would show up again the next year, and they had to do the whole thing. Passover would show up again the next year. They had to do the whole thing all over again. Because the Passover lamb never fixed the problem. But Jesus, as the embodiment and the fulfillment of all of this Passover typology, permanently fixed the sin problem. Jesus, when he died on the cross, did not just kick the can down the road. The issue is resolved. The sin question and problem that separates us from a holy God is resolved. So Jesus is the ultimate Passover lamb. That's why when he died, none of his bones could be broken. This is also predicted in Psalm 22, verse 17, where David, again, is having experiencing prophecies that go beyond him. And he says concerning Jesus, I, Psalm 22, verse 17, a thousand years in advance, I can count all my bones. And so how was this fulfilled? Well, it was fulfilled, as we saw earlier, in John 19, verses 31 through 36. It says, Now then, since it was the day of preparation to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath is a high day. Get these bodies down. We can't make sure they're down until they're dead because we got to get to our church service. The Jews requested of Pilate that their legs be broken and their bodies be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man. Remember, Jesus is crucified between two thieves. More on that in our next point that's coming up. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But after they came to Jesus, when they saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Yet one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. John says, and he who has testified, he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. For these things took place so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. The death of Jesus Christ is so incredible to understand because circumstances were oriented so he'd be pierced. And yet the same God that organized and oriented those circumstances also oriented them and organized them so that none of his bones would be broken. Because what the, Roman sold, uh, what the crucified victims used to do is they would push themselves up 
Because typically what happened with crucifixion is you died because you couldn't breathe. You were, you were suffocating. And so to get your next breath, you'd sort of push yourself up and catch your next breath. And these people had to get to church, right? So let's break their legs so they can't push themselves up. Because i got to celebrate the Sabbath. And that way they'll die faster. We'll get these people dead and down from the cross so we can continue on with our religious activities. And they came to the thieves that were crucified alongside Christ and they broke one thief's legs and apparently another thief's legs and they got to Jesus and there's no reason to break his legs because he's already dead. Well, let's make sure he's dead. Let's get that old spear out and thrust it into his side. And that had to happen for the piercing prophecies to be fulfilled. And out of his side flows blood and water in a state of separation, indicating death. In those moments that Christ's life was waning away, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy was leaping into existence. Piercing was happening. Lack of breaking of bones for reasons we've tried to explain was happening as well this is a completely different take on holy week isn't it there is something else that had to happen this takes us to number nine he had to be crucified between two thieves notice isaiah 53 and verse 12 That's why I told you to keep your finger in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. It says in Isaiah 53 verse 12, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the plunder with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, watch this, and was counted with the transgressors. Counted with the wrongdoers. Numbered with the transgressors. It's it's interesting how literally that was fulfilled as Christ was literally crucified between two transgressors. Two thieves. Matthew 27 verse 38 says, At that time two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. And people say, well look at the contradiction in the Bible. He was crucified between two rebels, one gospel writer says, and Luke tells us that one of them was sympathetic to Christ and got saved in the end. Luke 19, verses 23 through 39, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other responded, rebuking him, and said, Do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, well, I hope you make it if you have enough good works. I don't know what good works uh, you can do when you're hanging on a cross. You can't even get your baptism certificate there. It says, and he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, look at the contradiction in the Bible. Matthew says two rebels. Luke says one rebel. Well, that's not a contradiction, folks. That's a conversion. They started off as rebels, but one of them, the sun melted his heart. The sun here, S-O-N, melted his heart as he was dying. And he reached out to Jesus by way of faith, receiving that free gift of salvation. And two men pass into eternity, and one of them we're going to see again. Because he's covered by the same blood we're covered by. Because we receive by faith what Jesus has done. But notice how specific Isaiah's prophecies are. He'll be numbered with the transgressors. He was crucified between the thieves. Exactly as Isaiah predicted 700 years in advance. This takes us to number 10. Now look at this. We may be 
getting close to concluding because there's 11. But don't celebrate yet. As you'll see. Don't want to create a false hope. Number 10, he would be buried in the tomb of a rich man. Notice Isaiah chapter 53 and notice verse 9. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. How, how literal is that exactly? Well, we know from John chapter 19 and verse 38. Now after these things, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews. Wait a minute now. You mean you can be a secret disciple of Jesus? Yes, you can. It's not necessarily good, but it's possible. Because God doesn't require discipleship to get to heaven. He requires faith alone in Christ alone. And so you stand before God by way of grace, whether you're outspoken about your faith or quiet about it. Now being outspoken about your faith is a good thing because that gains you rewards above and beyond salvation. But there are those that say very little about their Christianity. And we will see them in heaven as well because they're there by way of grace just like I am. I didn't get to heaven by becoming a preacher and a teacher and becoming public about my Christianity. I'm going to heaven because Jesus died in my place. And he's given me a gift I can't earn. So Joseph of Arimathea, sort of like Nicodemus in John's gospel, is a secret disciple. It says, now after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, requested of Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Joseph of Arimathea, a believer, becomes uh, sort of courageous and says, I want the body. Take the body down. He asked Pilate for permission. Why did he have to ask Pilate for permission? Because of what Pompey did in 63 BC. By taking away from the Jews the right to execute their own criminals. You had to always get Roman authority and Roman permission. And in this case, Pilate grants permission. And then you go over to Matthew's gospel recording basically the same events in Matthew 27 verses 56 57 through 60 and it says now when it was evening now here's the little detail that gets thrown in now when it was evening a rich man from Arimathea I mean not only was he a disciple but he was secret about it and he had money which shows you that you can be a rich disciple as well the issue is not do you own money, but does your money own you? Now when it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea named, uh, came named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his tomb, which he had cut out of the rock. And he rolled away a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. So Matthew just adds this detail. By the way, when Joseph of Arimathea came and took the body, he was wealthy. And what just leaped off the page into fulfillment was Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. Given 700 years in advance, that the Messiah, when he comes, would, we would be with a rich man in his death. Buried in the tomb of a rich man. That's exactly what happened. You can... You would think uh, people reading Isaiah's prophecies 700 years before Christ showed up would be allegorizing those prophecies. Oh, that's just speaking of spiritual wealth. No. These are the specifics of God's word that are being fulfilled on Holy Week, particularly as you move into the death of Jesus Christ. God cannot lie. 
When God speaks something, it has to happen. Even if God has to put different political powers in existence to maintain the specifics of his word, God will do that because his own character is on the line. And my goodness, if the Lord is that specific with the prophecies that have already been fulfilled, what is your attitude about the prophecies yet to come? I take those with an extreme degree of seriousness because of this track record that we're seeing here. This takes us to number 11, and this is why we're here this morning, right? The prophecies don't just predict a crucified Messiah. They predict that he's going to come out of that grave. Where do we find that? Notice Isaiah 53 Verses 10 and 11, which is a tremendous prophecy dealing with the death of Christ. But then it says this. But the Lord desired to crush him, causing him grief. If he renders himself as a guilt offering. See, everything up to this point in this prophecy is death, 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 death to the Messiah. But you get to the end of the chapter and the tone changes and it says he will see his offspring. Now how can you see your offspring when you're dead? Well the implication is you'll be brought back to life. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Isaiah 53 verse 11. As a result of his anguish, his soul, of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By knowledge, his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many for he will bear their wrongdoings. Yes, there's a lot of prophecies about his death, but he is going to come back to life to the point where he will prolong his days and prosper. It's kind of hard to do that after you're dead. And he will see his offspring. Now, one of the places where the resurrection of Jesus Christ is very carefully predicted in the Old Testament is in Psalm 16, verses 10 and 11. Keep in mind, this one is a thousand years in advance. Keep in mind that, yes, it is a psalm about David, but the language goes far beyond David transcends David and begins to reveal a future Messiah. Notice, if you will, Psalm 16, verses 10 and 11. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the way of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. It specifically predicts that God the Father would not allow the crucified Messiah's soul to undergo or body to undergo decay. A pretty clear prophecy I think about the resurrection of Jesus. Peter Preaching on the day of Pentecost, a thousand years later, thought this prophecy was pretty significant. We understand what happened on the day of Pentecost, right? You happened. I happened. God started a new man called the church, which is not a nation. It's transnational. And it consists of anybody that has accepted by faith the Messiah that the first century Israel's establishment rejected. God took lemons and turned them into what? Lemonade. God took the horrific miscarriage of justice that happened with Israel in the first century and he used that transaction to attach the sin debt of the world to Jesus Christ who perfectly fulfilled the typology prefigurement in every detail and through that transaction Satan thought he had a victory but he just suffered a fatal wound because the sin debt of the world was now paid for 
And those that reject the message of first century Israel that rejected the Messiahship of Jesus, but changed their minds about Christ and embraced by faith what Jesus did for them on that cross are now part of this new man called the church. The beginnings of which was on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. Peter preaching the opening sermon on the day of Pentecost. Think about this, where 3,000 people are saved. That is an amazing sermon. I mean, when was the last time you preached a sermon and 3,000 people got saved? That's what happened there on the day of Pentecost. And Peter, I want to know what he preached, don't you? Peter, in this sermon, makes reference to the passage we just discussed, Psalm 16. And you'll find a reference to it in Acts 2, verses 22 through 32. This is masterful, expositional, biblical preaching of such fruit that there's 3,000 Jewish conversions. 3,000 people on this special day, the day of Pentecost, are saying national Israel is wrong. Their conclusions about this man, Jesus Christ, are wrong. We believe he is the Messiah. And one day he's going to be the Messiah of Israel. But for the time being, he's the head of this new man called the church, which is not a nation, it's not a country as Israel was. It's a spiritual organism. And you're brought into it the moment you trust in the Messiah for salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 32. Listen to Peter's sermon. We could read the whole thing. I'm just going to read a, a little bit of it. Acts 22, excuse me, Acts 2, beginning in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God had performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you, that's Israel, nailed to a cross by hands of godless men, and you put him to death. But, that's an important word, isn't it? Things look like a loss, but God, amen? But God, in this case God the Father, raised him from the dead, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. Now, he starts quoting the Bible here. He's a good preacher. Makes reference to the biblical text. And what text is he referring to here? Beginning in verse, what is it, 24. Psalm 16, which we just read, written a thousand years beforehand. For David, that's Psalm 16, says of him, I saw the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue was overjoyed. Are, are you overjoyed and glad today? You should be. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Are you living in hope today? You should. Because you're on the right side of history. Because of Jesus' conquest. Verse 27, Acts 2. Tell me if this sounds familiar. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make full, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. What is he referring there to? He's quoting Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And then Peter says this, because I may confidently say to you, now it's Peter speaking, regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Peter is saying Psalm 16 couldn't be about David, even though David wrote it, because David never came out of the grave the way 
Psalm 16 is describing. In fact, let's take a stroll, Peter says. Let's go visit David's tomb right now. David's tomb is still full. So Psalm 16 couldn't be a reference just to David as many people misconstrue it. He concludes his sermon and he says, So because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Now that's the future throne of David that Jesus will occupy in the millennial kingdom. Something that couldn't happen unless he's a living savior. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. It is this Jesus whom God raised up, a fact to which we are all witnesses. Fascinating. He doesn't, he doesn't make some kind of apologetic argument, although I'm not against apologetic arguments. He appeals to the script. Right down to the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the most well attested events in human history. I've used this quote earlier in the first session with Josephus, but Josephus spoke of it. A first century historian, but about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he is one who performs surprising deeds and was a teacher of such peoples as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ and went upon the accusation of principled men among us. Pilate, interesting, he confirms the historicity of Jesus and Pilate here. In fact, there are archaeological remains that I've seen in the land of Israel that most people believe is a reference to Pontius Pilate. It's there in Caesarea. You can Google it and take a look at it. Not now, of course. Pilate had condemned him to a cross. He's confirming that that's how the Romans killed people, crucifixion. Those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life, resurrection. For the prophets of old, God had foretold these things, and thousands of other marvels about him he did. And the tribe of Christians, so-called after him, has not ceased to this day nor disappeared. These Christians, they keep multiplying. Because the body of Christ had been formed and 3,000 were saved. And then as Luke recounts the number, 5,000 were saved. And the number keeps growing. And it's growing to this day. And then Josephus says here, I, I like Andy Wood's sermon. Because he says this was revealed by the prophets of God. The prophets of God foretold these things, which is our focus here. Eleven prophecies in Holy Week that all came into fruition in one person's life in one week's period of time. You know, I have often thought if I was a skeptic that hated Christianity... And I had lived in this time period in the first century when these things happened. If I was a Roman authority that didn't want the spread of Christianity. If I was an unbelieving Jewish authority and didn't want the spread of Christianity. And these Christians keep running around and they keep talking about this resurrected Christ. Wouldn't it be a very easy thing to go into the tomb and reproduce the body? To discredit the whole movement. Here he is. He never rose from the dead. The problem is. They couldn't do that with Jesus. Because there was nothing in the tomb. That's why we say that. The resurrection of Jesus. Is a historical fact. Confucius tomb. Occupied. Buddha's tomb. Occupied. Muhammad's tomb. Occupied. Jesus' tomb, what? Empty. Which leads to the gospel. 
And when we finish the gospel, we're not quite done yet. Because we have to do a conclusion. Amen? I didn't hear a very hearty amen on that. Jesus said to her, I am, John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, everyone who, believe, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. You see how Jesus attached the gospel to the resurrection. Here he resurrected, what was it, Lazarus from the dead, at least resuscitated him. But then he says, I am the resurrection. I'm going to resurrect. And if you believe in me, in other words, trust in what I'm about to do on Holy Week, through my death and burial, and then you see the proof of it, which is about to happen Sunday morning, giving you authenticity to who I am. And if you trust in what I've done for you, rather than what you do for yourself, by way of religion, you have eternal life. No questions asked. The thief on the cross accepted this at the end of his life and went into eternity with God. As we present the gospel, we want everybody that hears this to do the same thing, to believe on this message. This is not a 12-step program. It's a one-step program where you trust, which means faith, in what Jesus did for you, and you're brought into these promises. So, by way of conclusion, as we think about 11 prophecies fulfilled in the life of Christ on Holy Week, I want you to understand that in the life of Christ, there aren't 11, there's 109 we just looked at 11 in one week's time period. What are the odds that such prophecies could be fulfilled in one person? Peter Stoner, a mathematician, looked into this subject and he said, let's focus on just eight prophecies. Forget the 11, let's focus on eight. Forget the 109, let's just focus on the eight. And he gave this analogy. Suppose that we take 10 to the 17th silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. Now we like him already, right? He's using our state as an analogy. They will cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man. And tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? When you mark a silver dollar, the whole state of Texas is two feet deep in silver dollars. You blindfold someone. You can walk anywhere in the state, but just randomly reach down and pick up a silver dollar. And it has to be the one with the red X on it. And there's only one of those. Think of the chances and the improbabilities, if not impossibility, of that happening. Stoner, a mathematician, says what chance would he have of getting the right one? Just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them come true in any one man from their day to the present time providing that they were writing using their own wisdom. There's the rub. They weren't writing using their own wisdom. They were writing using divine wisdom. But if just eight could materialize in a person, that's like 10 to the 17th power. Eight prophecies coming to, in existence in one man, 10 to the 17th power. One in 10 to the 17th power. Not just improbable, impossible, and yet it happened. And we've looked at 11 that were just fulfilled in a week. There's 109 of these. So, by way of review, you have nothing like this in any other alleged holy book. 
the religion of Islam in the Quran, no prophecies like this that can be validated in history. Buddhism, no prophecies that can be validated in history. The same with Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, Mormonism, Sikhism. I don't even know what that is. Shinto is, how does it say it? Shintoism. And yet you're holding in your book history in advance. So 11 prophecies. The day of Palm Sunday predicted 600 years in advance. Riding into Jerusalem on a donkey predicted 500 years in advance. National rejection of is by Israel of Christ 600 years in advance. Jesus going through what he went through and maintaining his innocence. 700 years in advance. He would be silent before his accusers. 700 years in advance. They would gamble for his clothing. 1,000 years in advance. He'd be pierced. 700 years in advance. None of his bones would be broken. 1,000 years in advance. Crucified between two thieves. 700 years in advance. Buried in the tomb of a rich man. 700 years in advance. Resurrect bodily from the dead, which is what today is all about thousand years in advance how can a logical rational mind look at this evidence and simply have no room for Christ it doesn't make any sense and so our exhortation is for people to receive the gospel which is free we've already explained what it is if you have questions about it I'm available after the service to talk, shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for Holy Week. And we're grateful not just for what the New Testament records about it, but we're grateful for the things that you spoke about it long before it ever came to pass. We're truly holding in our hands the Word of God. Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. May we keep these thoughts in the forefront of our minds on this special day. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.